There's a new show coming to the Hyperion Theater. What is it? There's news on Reedy Creek. Park hopping rules at Disneyland change today. And lots more all coming up next on Fresh Bake. Hi guys, David here with Fresh Bake with news from around the Disney parks. For example, let's talk about that casting call that uh, got a little run on social media the other day. A casting call for a show at the Hyperion Theater in California Adventure. Disneyland Casting put out a call for an exciting new Broadway caliber theatrical production at the Disneyland Resort for a limited run at the Hyperion Theater. Right away then, this is confirmed for Disneyland confirmed at the Hyperion Theater. It's being done in partnership with book writer Hunter Bell and music by Christopher Leonards. Is Bell writing something new? That's a question. Uh, based on his past credits, I don't see a lot there that would suggest that they're adapting something he's written already. The closest thing was Villains Tonight, a show that they do on the uh, Disney Cruise Line. I don't think that's it. And also, this will be something new for Leonards, whose <laughs> current resume is, is kind of wild. He is all over the place. But there was one credit that I found interesting. He did the music for Agent Carter. He also actually wrote the song. The, the, there's a musical number in Agent Carter, the first of its kind in any sort of Marvel production. That's something to consider. Now, before you get too far ahead, he did not write the music for Rogers the Musical, the song that they play in the Hawkeye show. Uh, which, I mean, there's a lot of... There's a lot of people who really want to see that. It's a, it was a parody. It's not real. But there's a lot of people who want to see Rogers the Musical actually done and done in a Disney park. Now, as for the actual cast that is being sought, there's some interesting things to note here as well. Role number one, three female identifying roles with a range of ages between 20 and 50. Harmonies, fun, energetic, sisterhood. They will act as a Greek chorus. Now, I put them in air quotes because that's what Disney did in the call. They put Greek chorus in quotes, which suggests to me that it's not meant to be taken literally. Uh, they're, they're using a phrase. They are not literally casting for a literal Greek chorus. And that's an important distinction because the first thing that a lot of people uh, assumed or leapt to when drawing conclusions from this announcement or this casting call was that this was going to be for Hercules. Hercules does have a Greek chorus. There's those three girls who sing. And they, you know, it's really cool. It's, I like it. But a Greek chorus is actually quite common in Broadway productions. So we shouldn't necessarily assume it's for Hercules, even though Hercules does have a Greek chorus in it. Okay, role number two is asking for a female in her 20s to 30s, brave, resourceful, and intelligent, must have a strong English accent. Strong. Meg didn't have a, a, an English accent, at least not in Disney's version of the, you know, the animated film. Meg did not have an English accent. Of course, we're assuming that that's what this is for. The female lead in Hercules is Meg. Now, not that I would ever second-guess Disney for casting somebody with an English accent for Meg. That wouldn't bother me one bit. It would be perfectly normal. But in the way it's phrased in the casting call, it's a requirement. They must have a strong <laughs> English accent. That means very much that the person who's playing this is very much a British person. Agent Carter comes to mind. She's very much British. In fact, she's so British, she became, at one point, Captain Britain. There's Captain America, and then there's Captain Britain. Role number three, asking for a male between 17 and 20, coming into his greatness. Now, that could be Hercules for sure. That's right about how old Hercules would have been uh, in the animated film. I... He's coming into his greatness, so, I mean, that, that makes sense. But there's also another character who could be considered this. Uh, Captain America, perhaps. Steve Rogers, maybe. And then the other two lead characters are both uh, male characters. Nothing, we can, nothing can be learned from the description of the person they're trying to cast that would suggest somebody specifically. Now, what show would cast uh, a Greek chorus, a female Greek chorus, as a significant lead player in the show? Uh, a, a female British, specifically British lead, and then a male lead who's in his 17, or who's between 17 and 20 years old. I, I actually don't know. I'm asking you guys. <laughs> I don't know. But I have an idea. I mean, obviously, Agent Carter makes sense. Uh, her character is getting a, a, a higher billing than the male lead in, in terms of the casting call. I don't know how much we can infer from that, but 
that is the case. It feels like they're leading towards the female chorus, female lead, and then another male lead. Agent Carter comes to mind, but I don't think this is going to be an Agent Carter show. Now, what's interesting is the ages. The, they are specifically asking for a male identifying lead who is between 17 and 20, and a female identifying lead who is between 20 and 30. So they are, they are definitely driving at a, a, an age difference. Now, I'm not sure. I feel, like, I feel like Peggy Carter was older than Captain America or Steve Rogers in the first Captain America film. Obviously, he doesn't age going forward, or he ages very slowly anyway. Uh, so I don't know if that's, I mean, it's possible. It does kind of reconcile a little bit. However, <laughs> Steve Rogers, I want to say, was maybe in his early to mid-20s in Captain America. By the time that he had met Peggy Carter, by the time he got enlisted in the Army, he was probably in his mid-20s. So that, that kind of is older than the 17 to 20 age skew that they're looking for. That does actually line up more with Hercules. This is fascinating. But I have to say, the more I look into the casting, the more I look into who's you know, writing this and who's doing the music, and the more I think about the demand and the, what people want, if you put a gun to my head, I'm calling Rogers the musical. That's what I, <laughs> if you put a gun to my head, Rogers the musical. And I, and I hope that it is, if I'm being honest. I hope that it is. I mean, Hercules would be great. That's fun. I think they're doing a Broadway show on that one already, aren't they? Uh, you know, other things that have been suggested, Coco, I think, was suggested to me at one point. But nothing lines up more, nothing lines up better than Rogers the Musical in terms of the transition from Avengers Campus to Hollywood Land. That makes much more sense than trying to squeeze in Coco or Hercules. They, both of those shows have nothing to do with either of those lands. Aven or, uh, Rogers the Musical does. And, and it's really fun. <laughs> and I think people want it. It's going to be fascinating. I can't wait to find out. There's no timeline on when this is going to happen. But if they're doing the, uh, the casting call now, it could be a little while still before we see anything, any new show in the Hyperion Theater. I, it's possible that they could be building sets already. It, it would make sense that they, they should be or they would be. Matter of fact, uh, I think that I've, I, I remember hearing somebody reporting that they saw stuff being brought into the Hyperion Theater backstage, props, etc. So it could be. Okay, let's talk next about Reedy Creek, a subject that I have been very passionate about. I've been following closely since the, you know, the news story developed. When we last left it, uh, the Florida State Legislature had voted to end the Reedy Creek District. They voted to completely dissolve it. And that was to be done by, I think, June of this year. Though since then, there have been some developments that suggest that the district might stay intact, but with some modifications. Then late last week, Governor Ron DeSantis said that uh, they're going to call a special session for Monday, this coming Monday. And in that special session, they would discuss the possibility of the state of Florida taking over the Reedy Creek District. So hearing that, you know, though that the status of Reedy Creek is certainly better today than it was when we first got, you know, when this news story first developed, I still am uneasy about its future. Now, a quick primer on Reedy Creek. This is a special district that was set up by the state of Florida way back in the 50s, uh, or before that even, I think, that allowed for that area to be developed quickly and without government interference. That area, Reedy Creek, is basically what we know today as Walt Disney World. And the Disney company essentially runs it. That means they are responsible for all of the infrastructure, you know, fire, uh, police, you know, highways, roads. But it also means that they are free to do basically whatever they want. They can build whatever they want, however they want. And they can do all that without having to go through the city or the state. It's an immense competitive advantage for Disney, and it's one that they've taken advantage of for the better part of, well, the entire timeline of Walt Disney World. They are essentially, as it's been described, their own government. Disney is the, <laughs> runs the government in the Reedy Creek District in uh, Walt Disney World. Ron DeSantis, governor of Florida, is not a fan of the Disney company, a very vocal unfan of the Disney company. He calls them a woke company. And he is also not a fan, obviously, of the Reedy Creek District. Recently on this topic, he said that he's going to make sure that Disney doesn't have self-governing status anymore. 
He said they're going to make sure that there are no special legal privileges. I mean, that's <laughs> that, those are strong words. That sounds like a man who's got a, a plan and who wants to make a point. So while things aren't as bad as they seemed, you know, a year ago or whenever this story broke, uh, they de they definitely do not have a fan in Ron DeSantis, and they're kind of running out of fans, really, uh, within the, the entire state legislature for Florida. Stay tuned to Fresh Bake on how that special uh, session goes on Monday. I'm hoping that we learn something. I hope we get to see a little bit of the future for Reedy Creek and for Walt Disney World. In the meantime, let's talk about park hopping. If you have a park hopper or a magic key, when you make your reservation, you have to choose a starting park. And then you have to stay there until at least 1 p.m. And at 1 p.m., you can hop over to the other park. This system, this park hopping rule, is a byproduct of the reservation system. If you have a reservation system, then you have to have some kind of park hopping rule. If you don't have a reservation system, you wouldn't need a park hopping rule at all. You could just go to whatever park you feel like anytime. The reservation system sucks, <laughs> so too does the park hopping rule. But as of today, as of right now, Disney has relaxed that rule just a little bit. Uh, rather than 1 p.m., as of today, you can park hop at 11 a.m. at the Disneyland Resort. Now, this is good news specifically for those guests who, they want to go to Disneyland, but there were no Disneyland as a, as a starting park reservations available. There was only a DCA starting park reservation available. So now you go to DCA and then you can jump over to Disneyland at 11 a.m. Not only is it an extra two hours, but in some cases, I would imagine that there's a, there's a percentage of guests who don't even get to the park until 11 a.m. It's as if there is no park hopping rule, that they just go to Disneyland when they get there at 11 a.m. Now, I get that it's, it's a small thing. It's, it's just two hours, and, and the rule still does exist. But this is a very nice indicator of Disney perhaps softening their position on the reservation system, you know, irrespective of the actual park hopping rule. What this is really about is the reservation system. The more that they, the more that that number, that that park hopping number gets down to zero, <laughs> or gets down to 8 a.m. or whatever, the closer you get to no reservation system. If that becomes, you know, 10 a.m. or 9 a.m. or whatever, then you might as well not have one. So it's a very good sign that it's being pushed down. That gets us closer to no reservation system. Another indicator of Disney's changing attitudes towards this is the fact that and this is already happening over at Walt Disney World. If you have an annual pass. You don't even need a reservation if you just want, if you go to the park during the week and after 2 p.m. Go to, go to Magic Kingdom at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday and you can just walk in, no reservation required at all. That sounds fun. That sounds great. <laughs> Thank you. And if you want another indicator, we got one more. Club 33. Uh, they don't need reservations at all anymore. Club 33 can show up whenever they want. So each one of these is a small little chip on the wall that's eventually... I feel like in this direction, it's eventually going to break. This wall will break. So I wasn't very confident about the reservation system ending anytime soon. These three things add up to a definite trend, momentum towards that. Okay, a couple more stories that I want to uh, run by you. You may recall, uh, I would say uh, maybe a month or two ago, I predicted uh, that Disney was going to start doing some things. They were going to start monetizing things that weren't monetized before things that were just extra benefits for certain guests. For example, Magic Morning. Certain guests can have access to the park uh, before all the regular paying guests. If, if the regular paying guests get in at 8 o'clock, Magic Morning guests who have that experience, who have that early entry pass, get in at 7.30. Presently, this is reserved for only those guests who are staying at a resort hotel, Grand California and Disneyland Hotel, Pixar Place Hotel. Uh, and it's for just a half an hour. Now, I had predicted before that Magic Morning was the kind of thing that Disney would eventually try to sell a la carte to, to any guest. Now, they're not doing it. That's, this, that's not the story that I'm telling now. They're not doing it, not yet. But Universal Studios in Hollywood is. In a couple of weeks, Super Nintendo World will be open to the public, and Universal is offering guests the opportunity to buy an extra hour before the park opens for $20. Now, that hour is limited. Uh, it's only to Super Nintendo World, not the entire park. Just Super Nintendo World. And then when you're done, hopefully before 11 a.m., that's the whole point of this, you can also get uh, express access to the Backlot Tram Tour as, a, as an added bonus. You have to do that before 11 a.m. So that's a little perk they've thrown in there. They're expecting a lot of demand from Mario Town. I am too. The place is beautiful. I love it. But while we observe how this land does, coming, uh, what, February 17th is when it opens, we can also now observe to see 
if this is the kind of thing, paying for Magic Morning is something that guests are into. Are you interested in paying $20 for an extra hour uh, at Super Nintendo World? You know what? Even better than the extra hour. That's not even why I'd pay. I'd pay $20 perhaps for the chance to be in the land when it's not completely bonkers, crazy, full of people, and you can do whatever you want for it. I mean, imagine what you could get done in an hour. But having said that, there is just the one ride. <laughs> and I mean, I, I kind of wonder, is it as fun doing those little side games by yourself with nobody else in the park or with a few people in the park? And you're just sitting there spamming the, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the mystery block with your wand or with your, I mean, with your uh, power-up band? Like, there's a... Part, I, I feel like part of that, part of that enjoyment is, is being there with the crowd, but I mean, that's, I'm crazy that way. Uh, that, but that, I mean, that seems like a pretty cool opportunity, a possibility, an option for some guests. Now, what, is that something that you would be willing to pay for at Disneyland? Keep in mind, Universal is selling theirs for just the one land. Uh, you know, what would Disney sell theirs for? Now, uh, the whole park isn't open at Disneyland either. When it's magic morning, early entry, whatever they call it, it's just Tomorrowland and just Fantasyland. What would you pay for an hour, you know, between 7 a.m. and 8 a.m. to do as many rides as possible in that hour, you know, at Fantasyland and Disneyland? $20 seems light. Uh, I, I wonder, you know, let us know in the comments, guys. I, I would like to hear if you're interested in that and what your price point would be. But I do think that this is something that's destined for the near future. Will Disneyland follow Universal's lead? But well, that would be a switch, huh? Okay, finally, we've got some news for you, some details for those fans of the Run Disney events. New details have been revealed for the event that's coming up that's scheduled for January of 2024. There will be a 5K, a 10K, a half marathon, a kids race, and even a little yoga. All are set for uh, January 11th through January 14th in 2024. Registration for the Disneyland Yoga Session begins this February 14th at 7 a.m. Pacific. So about a year in advance. The cost is $108.99. The 5K will begin registering on February 7th. That's just a couple days from now. With fees ranging from $108.99 to $118.99. Registration for the 10K begins February 7th at 7 a.m. With fees ranging from $148.99 to $159.99. And the kids' race registration, that begins February 14th with a cost of $35. The half marathon set for January 14th will take reservations on February 7th with fees ranging from $234.99 to $244.99. And then the Dumbo Double Dare, where guests compete in both the 10K and the half marathon, its registration begins February 14th at a fee of $389, or you can wait until July 18th to register with a fee of $409. There will also be virtual races with registration beginning on February 17th for those events as well. And that's it for the news this week, guys. Stay tuned to Fresh Bake for more updates from within the park, construction updates. We're going to be working on that next. Stay tuned for that. And then follow us on Instagram at underscore Fresh Bake. On Twitter at Fresh Baked Disney, that's Fresh with No E, and on TikTok at Fresh Baked Disney. And if you like our show and want to show your support, please do consider joining our Patreon campaign at patreon.com slash freshbaked. Otherwise, thanks again for watching, everybody. We love you. Be safe out there. Be kind to one another. Fresh Baked.